Hello friends, this is a shortened audio version of Valmiki Ramayana narrated by D. Sumabindu. Please like and subscribe to my channel and do not forget to hit the bell icon for further updates. Ramayana, the Enchanting Epic, Chapter 1 Valmiki, the First Poet Long, long ago, deep in the forest was an ashram that belonged to sage Valmiki. The sage built his ashram on the banks of river Tamasa and lived there along with his disciples. Located in a peaceful atmosphere, Valmiki's ashram became a harmonious place to live in. As it always resounded with recitals of mantras and Vedas, having known about the serenity of the place, many sages started living there with families. Sage Valmiki provided place for all who desired to live there, which made it livelier. The sons of the sages who lived there became disciples of Sage Valmiki. Of all the disciples he had, a young man named Bharadvaja was the sage's favourite. Bharadvaja not only was a devoted disciple, but also took good care of his teacher always. He followed Sage Valmiki wherever he went and personally took care of all his needs. One day, as usual, Sage Valmiki visited the river Tamasa along with Bharadvaja. Delighted to see the pure water of the river, Valmiki decided to bathe in the river. He entered the river, looking at the pleasant surroundings of the forest. His mind was calm and pleasant. He enjoyed the scenes of nature and experienced extreme serenity during his bath. As he looked around, he found a couple of lovely birds flying together. He was extremely happy to see the great bonding the birds shared and continued to look at them. Suddenly, the male bird was shot by an arrow and died instantaneously. Shocked to see its companion falling to the ground with blood dripping all over, the female bird helplessly circled over the body of its mate. Valmiki too was astounded at the sudden incident and looked around to find out who had shot the bird. As the sage's eyes fell on the hunter who killed the bird, his heart ached with agony and his mind filled with anger. Out of his extreme anger, he cursed the hunter that, just like the bird, he too would not live long. The curse was uttered by him in Sanskrit, and the words in it were well arranged, which fell in a rhythm. Still looking at the dead bird and the helpless female bird, Sage Valmiki sat with tear-filled eyes for a long time. After he got over the incident, he thought about his curse on the hunter. He knew that, due to the impact of the curse, the hunter would not live long. As he still thought about it, the sage remembered the words he used to curse the hunter. Recalling them, he was amazed that they fell into rhythm. Bharadvaja too stood there amazed to find that his teacher had uttered the curse in a poetic form. Both of them did not know what it was, but they walked back to the ashram thinking about it. Once Valmiki reached his ashram, he recited the poem once again. Bharadvaja sat near his feet and checked if it could be sung in a tune. The rhythmic nature of the verse fitted into the most melodious tune, which amazed both Valmiki and Bharadvaja. As Valmiki pondered over it again and again, he wondered how he could utter the verse in such a fashion. He knew not what it was. At the same moment, the divine sage Narada arrived at the ashram of sage Valmiki. Overwhelmed by the visit of his mentor, Valmiki received him with utmost respect and affection. Serving him milk and fruits, he treated him with great courtesy and care along with his disciples. Narada's visit to the ashram had provided Valmiki an opportunity to clarify his doubts from his guru. He decided to explain the morning's incident to Narada and seek his advice. But before he could speak, sage Narada said, O oh, sage Valmiki, the verses you uttered today out of your sorrow mark the beginning of a great era in literature. Unaware of what you said, you have recited a poem 
with rhyming words. To be the first one to utter the first sloka, you would be remembered by the world forever as the first poet, Adi Kavi. As Sage Valmiki heard his way, words in awe, Narada said, Valmiki, having initiated this divine process, do not stop it here. Take a forward step without delay and at once start reciting Ramayana, the story of Lord Rama in the same fashion through slokas. Ramayana would be known forever as Adikavya, the first epic that would exist still the end of the, this world. Etched along with it would be your name for the generations to come. On hearing Sage Narada's words, Sage Valmiki trembled in fear. He was apprehensive if he could shoulder such a huge responsibility. Nullifying all his fears, Sage Narada reassured that he was the chosen one to accomplish the task. Settling down a little with the thought of reciting Ramayana, Valmiki bowed to Sage Narada and sought a few clarifications from him. After seeking Narada's permission, Valmiki asked him, O oh, Divine Sage, there is nothing you do not know. Please tell me about the most virtuous, truthful, caring person of all the human beings. Enlighten me with details of such a person who is also brave, valiant, humble, good-looking, self-determined and who is radiant with good conduct. Pleading sage Narada to quench his inquisitiveness, he again said, O sage, being the son of Brahma, the creator of the world, and also a knowledgeable sage who wandered in all the three worlds, I am certain that you know the answers to all my questions. Please bless me with the details. Listening to the humble, sincere plea of Valmiki, Narada decided to enlighten him with answers and cautioned him to listen attentively. He then told him that the person whom he asked about was none other than Lord Rama, who possessed all the qualities he mentioned. He then narrated him the story of Lord Rama, explaining him in detail about Rama's birth, childhood, education, marriage, exile to forest, abduction of Sita by Ravana, fierce battle between Rama and Ravana, and finally the triumphant return of Rama along with his wife and brother to Ayodhya. Valmiki was spellbound to hear the story of Rama and was grateful to Narada for bestowing on him the knowledge he sought. Happy to be served courteously, Narada left the ashram, blessing Valmiki wholeheartedly, again reminding him of his task to start writing Ramayana. After Sage Narada left his ashram, Sage Valmiki discussed the contents of his conversation with Bharadwaja and sat in deep thought, still apprehensive about writing Ramayana. Meanwhile, Lord Brahma appeared before him all of a sudden. Prostrating before the Lord, Valmiki tried to explain him his apprehensions to Brahma. Stopping him midway, Lord Brahma said, O holy sage, the experience you have gained through the past several years is on one side and the task of writing Ramayana is on the other side. Do not hesitate. You have my blessings with you. As Sage Narada explained, you have the ability to write the story of Ramayana in the poetic form. You would earn great fame forever through this task. Go ahead without hesitation. Explaining him in several ways, Lord Brahma convinced Valmiki to take up the task of writing Ramayana. Shortly, Valmiki recited slokas daily, which Bharadwaja recorded carefully. The slokas he recited in his devotion is nothing but Ramayana, the Adi Kavya. Chapter 2 Rama, the heir of Raghuvamsa In the ancient days, many great kings ruled India. The kings of Raghuvamsa or Raku dynasty were very well known and famous for their efficient rule. For generations, India was safe in the hands of kings and emperors like Harishchandra, Dilipa and Raghu. They all belonged to Surya dynasty, which was later renamed as Raghuvamsa after the great emperor Raghu. 
such a great dynasty bore another famous emperor who was equally efficient and famous as his ancestors he was none other than king dasharatha king dasharatha ruled the country from ayodhya his capital city located on the banks of river sarayu dasharatha had three wives named kausalya sumitra and kaikeyi being his first wife kausalya always cooperated with her husband and supported him by all means being a soft spoken lady sumitra shared warm relations with kausalya and kaikeyi lively and kind hearted kaikeyi treated her husband and sisters with utmost care and won their hearts with the support of his three understanding wives king dasratha led a happy and peaceful life he also had eight learned ministers and three royal priests who advised him regarding the matters of the country of all his ministers dasratha's favorite was sumantra he also sought the advice of the learned saint vasishta who was the teacher of ragu dynasty the people in the country led a happy and prosperous life under his rule king dasratha took personal care to establish peace and harmony amongst his people though king dasratha had no complaints from his life the fact that he was still childless bothered him day and night as he grew older his worry got bigger constantly worried that raguvamsa rule would end with him if he remained childless king dasratha pondered over various ways to be blessed with children after seeking the advice of learned men and saints he decided to conduct ashwamedha yaga accordingly all arrangements were made and information was sent to various countries about the yaga prior to ashwamedha yaga a horse of good quality would be selected and left to roam around freely for one year an army would follow the horse wherever it goes whichever country the horse reaches the king of the country either should leave it free or fight with the army if the horse comes back to its own country after one year the king can start his yaga likewise dasharatha too chose a horse and sent it away along with the army on the tour after one year when his horse came back the arrangements of the yaga assumed speed as ashwamedha yaga neared its completion dasaratha's minister sumantra advised him about another religious ritual he said my lord as per our holy scriptures one who desires to be blessed with children should undertake another yagna known as putra kameshti as you have already started ashwamedha yaga why not go ahead with putra kameshti too extremely pleased by sumantra's suggestion dasaratha immediately agreed to the proposal and sent an invitation to maharshi rushyasringa for conducting the yagna king dasaratha treated the holy saint with utmost respect on his arrival and requested him to supervise the yagna in the presence of many learned men like saint rushyasringa vasishta and others king dasaratha took part in the yagna along with his three wives in anticipation of being blessed with children meanwhile in heaven the sages and gods decided to visit vaikuntha the divine abode of sri mahavishnu extremely terrified by the evil acts of ravana they knelt before lord vishnu seeking his mercy pleading his help they all said oh lord whenever we needed you you have been there for us always you rescued us from difficult situations in various incarnations many a times now please repeat your magic and rescue us from the torture of ravana hearing their plea lord vishnu looked at lord brahma and asked him to explain them their future course of action addressing them brahma said please do not worry soon lord vishnu is going to be born in human form to get us out of our troubles as all stood surprised on hearing about lord vishnu's incarnation as a human brahma continued there is a very strong reason why lord vishnu would be born as a human ravana sought a boon of not being killed by any of us while he anticipated danger from heavenly creatures like us he totally ignored human race 
That is why Lord Vishnu is going to be soon born as Rama, the son of King Dashrata, to king or kill all the Rakshasas like Ravana. While the entire crowd broke into applause on hearing the news, Brahma also instructed them to create an army to support Rama on the earth, while their respective strengths would be displayed. Thus, Brahma created Jambavanta, Vayu created Hanumanta, the sun created Sugriva, Indra created Vali, and Maya, the divine sculptor, created Nala. With their creations, they all awaited Lord Vishnu's arrival on the earth in order to follow him down. The much-awaited moment had finally arrived when King Dasharada conducted the Putra Kameshti Yajna with devotion and sincerity. On the last day of the Yajna, the Lord of Fire, Agni, arose from the holy fire. He held in his hands a golden pot that had sweet rice boiled in milk. Giving the pot to King Dasharada, he instructed him to distribute among his wives. Blessing everyone present there, Agni vanished. After the remaining rituals of the Yajna were fulfilled, King Dasharada distributed the contents of the golden pot to his wives and asked them to eat it. A few days after the Yajna, King Dasharada's joy knew no bounds when he was informed that his wives were pregnant. The king, his subjects and the entire population of Ayodhya awaited the arrival of their little princess. Months rolled by. And on an auspicious day and an auspicious moment, Kausalya gave birth to a beautiful boy whose face shone with divine radiance. While Sumitra gave birth to twins, Kaikeyi gave birth to another boy. Looking at his four sons, King Dashrata cried out of immense joy. The proud parents looked at their kids and thanked the Lord for making their dreams come true. Amongst pompous celebrations, the sons of the king were named as Rama, Lakshmana, Bharata and Satrugna. While Rama was Kausalya's son, Lakshmana and Satrugna were the twins born to Sumitra and Bharata was Kaikeyi's son. Even before King Dasharatha could come out of the pleasant memories of the birth of his sons, years rolled by and the boys grew up. They had become big enough to start their education. On an auspicious day, they started their studies under the guidance of Maharshi Vasishta. With the passing time, the four brothers turned into handsome, learned and disciplined young men, ready to take on new challenges. Though Dashrata considered them as kids, he could not neglect the fact that they were grown-up men. Proud to be a father of such wise and learned sons, King Dashrata dotted on them day and night. Chapter 3 Rama on his first mission One day, while Dasharada was holding his royal court, his guard announced the arrival of the great sage Brahmarshi Vishwamitra. Immediately, Dasharada went along with his ministers and other subjects to extend a warm welcome to the sage. After paying him respects, Dasharada personally led him to the court and seated him comfortably. Bowing to the sage again, King Dasharada said, O Brahmarshi, Ayodhya is overwhelmed by your ar arrival. Please tell me what service I can be of to you. Highly pleased with King Dasharada's reception, Vishwamitra replied, O King, I came on an important mission. For the welfare of this world, I am conducting a yaga. But my yaga is being disturbed by evil demons Maricha and Subahu. I have come here to take your son Rama along with me to kill those intruders. As soon as Dashrata came to know of Vishwamitra's intentions, he trembled with fear. The thought of sending his young son to battle against such ruthless demons sent quivers down his spine. Struggling to reply to the sage, Dashrata slowly said, Brahmarshi, my son Rama is not even 16 years old. How could a small kid like him battle such demons? Please spare him from this difficult task. I am already... I am ready to send my entire army 
to safeguard your yaga. Enraged by Dashirada's offer, Vishwamitra replied, King Dashirada, do not forget that you have promised to serve me. Is it not your duty to fulfill the wish of someone who came to you for help? If you cannot stand on your word and wish to defame your Raghuvamsa, then forget about our discussion. I wish to return empty-handed from here rather than take an army of cowardly king like you. As Vishwamitra's anger reached its peak, Dashirada stood there unable to take a decision. In order to handle the situation from going out of control, Sage Vasishta intervened and cooled Vishwamitra, promising him to convince Dasharada. Turning on to Dasharada, Sage Vasishta said, O king, who do you think is Sage Vishwamitra? There is no one on this earth to beat him, either in his intelligence or skills of archery. But still, he came here with a request to take Rama along with him. Though Rama is your kid, even he is no common man. Born as your son, he is here on this earth to accomplish divine tasks. You need not fear about Rama while he is with the great sage Vishwamitra. Leave your apprehensions at once and send him with Pramarshi. Convinced by Vashishta's words, King Dasharatha agreed to send Rama and also Lakshmana with Vishwamitra. Seeking the blessings of their parents and elders, both the brothers started on their journey to the ashram of sage Vishwamitra. They travelled by foot throughout the day till they reached the banks of river Sarayu. Though they had to cross the mountains, thorny paths and forests, not even once did they complain about any inconvenience. As sage Vishwamitra led the way, they humbly followed him, only concentrating on the task they had to accomplish. As soon as they reached the banks of river Sarayu, Vishwamitra took them to an ashram of another sage and asked them to rest for that night. The next morning, three of them decided to continue their journey after having some fruits and honey as breakfast. Before they started, Vishwamitra called them by his side and said, Sons, my ashram is a little distance away from this place. In a day, we would be there. But we have to be highly alert as the path from here is quite dangerous with dense forests. Hence, before we proceed today, I would like to teach you the mantras of Bala and Atibala, something that would keep you fresh always without feeling the necessity to either eat or rest. The task that lies ahead is very complex and demanding that would engage you continuously for several days. By chanting Bala and Atibala, you would not feel hungry or drowsy till your task is accomplished. Saying so, Vishwamitra taught them the mantras and blessed them to attain victory in the task ahead. The trio walked through dense forests throughout that day too. Vishwamitra showed them various important places they crossed during the course of their journey and explained the historic significance of each of them. After resting in another ashram that night, Vishwamitra bestowed them with the knowledge of usage of a few divine weapons that would help them in their battle ahead. As they almost reached Vishwamitra's ashram, the surroundings resounded of loud shouts and cries that could terrify even the bravest of men. As both the brothers looked around to check where those cries came from, Vishwamitra exclaimed, explained, Rama, those are the cries of the demon named Tataki. She is the cause of all trouble. I order you to kill her at once. Hearing sage Vishwamitra's orders, Rama fell into deep thought. He was apprehensive if it was just to use a weapon against a woman. As he voiced out his apprehensions, Vishwamitra said, Dear son, you have undertaken the task of protecting the cause of the Yaga, which is being conducted for the welfare of the world. Everything is just when it is done for a good cause. Do not hesitate further. Kill her at once in order to free many innocent lives from the deadly demon. As soon as Vishwamitra clarified his doubts, 
Rama bowed to him in acceptance and keenly observed the direction from which her voice came. Taking out his bow and arrows, Rama shot an arrow in the direction of the voice. Within a few seconds, his arrow pierced through the heart of Tataki, killing her instantaneously. Crying aloud with a loud crashing sound, Tataki fell to the ground dead. Extremely pleased by Rama's bravery and skills, Vishwamitra blessed him wholeheartedly. The triumphant team walked to the sage's ashram without delaying further. Soon after they reached the ashram, sage Vishwamitra made arrangements for his yaga. As he conducted the yaga with his other ashramites, Rama and Lakshmana stood there guarding the place. A little later, pieces of meat, blood and bones started pouring down from the sky. Annoyed, Vishwamitra turned to the brothers and said, Boys, these are the evil plans of Maricha, Tataki's son and Subahu, Tataki's brother-in-law. Enraged by her death, they are trying to interrupt the yaga. Kill them at once. Following his orders, Rama and Lakshmana released powerful arrows from their bows. While their arrows killed Subahu, Maricha was pushed away to a greater distance. From where he fled to the sea and hid out of fear. After getting rid of the demons, with their incredible shooting skills, both of them built an umbrella with their arrows exactly above the place of the yaga. For five continuous days, the sages performed the yaga, backed by the alert patrol of Rama and Lakshmana, and finished it successfully without further interruption. Highly pleased by their valor, Vishwamitra embraced the brothers and said, Rama, I am glad that my wish has been fulfilled. I would always remain grateful to you both and also your father, King Dasharada, for helping me in this yaga. I wish to teach you some important lessons and skills that would help you to be victorious in future. Vishwamitra led Rama and Lakshmana to his hut and there he taught them various significant matters. As they continued to learn from the great sage, Vishwamitra received a message from Midhila, the kingdom of King Janaka. Handing over the letter to Lakshmana, Vishwamitra asked him to read it aloud. The letter from King Janaka said, Brahmarshi, as I pay my humble respects to you, I would like to inform you that we have planned the Swayamvara of our daughter Sita. It is decided that Sita should marry the person who bends the bow of Lord Shiva, which had been in our possession since generations. I request you to honor the occasion with your holy presence. As Lakshmana finished reading, the letter Vishwamitra fell into deep thought for a while. Since the moment his yaga was fulfilled because of Rama and Lakshmana, the sage desired to express his gratitude to them in a unique way. By taking them to Sita Swayamvara, Vishwamitra decided to express his thankfulness to King Dasharatha and his sons. Immediately, he started on a journey to Mithila with Rama and Lakshmana. The path to Mithila too was a tedious one that led them through dense forests and rocky mountains. But both the brothers followed the sage humbly without complaining. Soon, they reached a deserted place in the forest. That place was extremely dull and lifeless. As they walked through that place, observing its surroundings, Rama placed his foot on a rock that lay in his path. As soon as he set his foot on it, lo, the rock turned into a beautiful woman. Rama himself was dumbstruck at the sudden happening. Before he could recover from the shock, the lady bowed to Rama and said, O oh Rama, thank you for freeing me from this dreadful curse. I hereby bless you to attain victory in all the tasks you undertake. Rama turned to Vishwamitra and requested him to explain in detail about the lady and her curse. Smiling at inquisitive Rama, Vishwamitra said, Rama, the woman's name is Ahalya. She is the daughter of Brahma. She was married to sage Gautama and led a happy life building an ashram in this very place. 
But due to some misunderstanding, Sage Gautama cursed her to turn into a lifeless stone. As Ahalya pleaded him to free her from the curse, Gautama took pity on her and told her that she would be freed only when you, Rama, set your foot on the rock. Since then, Ahalya lay here, waiting for you to pass this way. Amazed to hear the story of Ahalya, Rama and Lakshmana followed the sage silently towards Mithila. Chapter 4 Wedding Bells As Vishwamitra reached Mithila along with Rama and Lakshmana, King Janaka welcomed him wholeheartedly and arranged for their accommodation. They were informed that the Swayamvara was on the following day. The next morning, eligible princes from various kingdoms gathered in King Janaka's court for the Swayamvara. As soon as King Janaka commended the Swayamvara, all the princes who waited anxiously for the moment queued up before Lord Shiva's bow to exhibit their strength. Leaving aside bending the bow, not even a single prince could at last succeed in lifting it. Lost in their thoughts, in their attempts, the mightiest princes went back with their heads hung in shame. Finally, it was the turn of Lord Rama. Seeking the blessings of Sage Vishwamitra, Rama walked towards the bow with a serene face that shone radiantly. Laying his hands on the bow, Rama tried to fix its string. Soon, the old precious bow succumbed to his might and broke with a loud noise. The cracking sound of the will indicated to Sita, who sat there, wheeled that Rama was her man. Amidst loud cheers and floral rain from heaven, the beautiful Sita walked shyly towards Rama and put the garland around his neck. Overwhelmed to have found a suitable match for his daughter, King Janaka sent a wedding invitation along with many gifts to King Dasharatha, informing him of Lord Rama's victory at the Swayamvara. Highly pleased to hear the news, King Dasharatha at once started to Mithila with his wives, sons, Sage Vasishta and other subjects. Extending a hearty welcome to the groom's family, King Janaka personally supervised their accommodation arrangements. Meanwhile, learned men like Vasishta and others proposed marriage to all the four brothers together. Appreciating their proposal, King Janaka agreed to marry Sita to Rama, Urmila to Lakshmana, Mandavi to Bharata and Srutakirti to Sratugna. While Sita was the only daughter of King Janaka, the other three girls were his brother's daughters. Soon, all the four weddings were held in a grand scale in the royal palace of King Janaka amidst cheers, music and holy prayers. After the completion of the pompous celebrations, as King Dasharada expressed his wish to go back to Ayodhya along with his family, King Janaka placed his daughter's hands in the hands of the four brothers and bid them a tearful farewell, pleading them to take good care of his young and delicate daughters. Promising to treat their wives with utmost care, the four brothers proceeded towards Ayodhya. As they travelled halfway, suddenly a huge wind encircled their caravan. The surroundings resounded with fierce, loud sounds. As they looked around to see where the sounds came from, there came a radiant, fierce-looking man with a bow in one hand and axe in the other. He was none other than the great Parasurama, a Rajarishi and one of the incarnations of Lord Vishnu. Walking straight to Rama, he roared, O son of Tashrita, I heard that you broke the bow of Lord Shiva in Sita Swayamvara. Extending the bow in his hand to Rama, he again said, If you are so valiant and strong, bend this bow of Lord Vishnu and prove your might. Though provoked by Parasrama's challenge, Rama maintained a pleasant smile on his face and silently walked towards Parasrama. He took Lord Vishnu's bow into his hands and tied the string to its tip with great ease. As soon as he took the bow into his hands, Rama shone with divine radiance. His radiance spread in all directions, 
leaving the viewers shocked. Even Parasurama was shell-shocked to see the expert eyes with which Rama handled the bow. Aiming an arrow ready to be shot, Rama said, O oh, Parasurama, this arrow should not go waste. Shall I destroy your physical being with this arrow or your divine spiritual power? I leave the choice to you. Realizing that Rama is none other than Lord Vishnu, Parasurama bowed to him and replied, O oh Rama, you have won. As per the word I gave to sage Kashyapa, I have to reach his place before sunset. I need my physical powers to keep my word. Hence, please take away the spiritual powers I have attained. Saying so, he bowed to Rama witnessing the transfer of his spiritual powers to Rama. He praised Rama's abilities, bowed in reverence and left that place immediately. King Dasharatha, who witnessed his son's valor for the first time, was overwhelmed by pride and embraced Rama affectionately. Chapter 5 Exile from Ayodhya The people of Ayodhya eagerly awaited the arrival of the newly wed couples. The city too witnessed pompous celebrations for several days. King Dasharada declared a grand feast for the entire population of Ayodhya and distributed new clothes to every household. The palace's grandeur increased by thousand folds with the entry of the four daughters-in-law who were equally well-behaved and humble as their husbands. King Dasharada and his queen's joy knew no bounds whenever they thought of their fortune to be blessed with four gems as their sons. Soon, thirteen years rolled by in peace and prosperity. Due to his growing age, King Dasharada decided to hand over his responsibility to Rama, his eldest son. One fine day, while presiding over the court, he disclosed his intentions to his courtiers. Addressing them, he said, Dear courtiers, through all these years, I have ruled this kingdom to the best of my abilities. Now, I guess it is time to move on and hand over the responsibility to the next generation. My growing age is not allowing me to shoulder these responsibilities anymore. Being my eldest son and also as a man who possesses all the qualities to become a king, I feel that Rama should become Ayodhya's next king. Please let me know your opinion too. As soon as Dasharatha mentioned about Rama, the court broke into applause and all the courtiers agreed to his proposal. Immediately, King Dasharatha sent for Rama. Standing before his father humbly, Rama asked him what his orders were for him. With a smile, Dasharatha informed Rama that he wished to see him as the next king of his kingdom. Rama took his word as an order and consented to be made the king. Immediately, an auspicious day was fixed and the grand arrangements for the same were made. While Lakshmana took part in the arrangements with great excitement, Bharata and Satrugna were away from Ayodhya as they went on a visit to their uncle's kingdom. The whole palace bust with great activity and so were the chambers of the three queens. Kaikeyi, whose favourite was Rama, was thrilled to hear the news. As she moved around the palace in excitement, her loyal servant Mandara looked at her in awe. Soon after Mandara found Kakeyi alone in her chamber, she approached her and said, I am amused at your innocence. Confused with such a sudden comment, Kaikeyi asked Mandara to explain. Mandara said, Till now you believed that you are the favourite wife of the king. But today he had not even informed you before he took a decision about making Rama the king. When Kaikeyi tried to reason out and argue, Mandara stopped her and continued, The king had planned all this exactly when your own son Bharata is away from the kingdom. Don't you find any conspiracy behind it? Once Rama becomes the king, Kausalya would take a significant place and I am sure you would be left behind. I am worried what turn your life would take now. 
Mandra's words had the desired impact on Kaigi. Poisoned by her words, Kaigi at once forgot her years of affection for Rama. Turning to Mandra, she said, Mandra, mark my word. I won't rest till I make Bharata the king of Ayodhya, but give me some quick idea how to proceed. Waiting for a chance, Mandra reminded her of the two boons. King Dasharadas promised to give her several years back. She asked Kaiki to use those boons against Rama and in favor of Bharata. As per the plan, Kaiki removed all her jewels and sat in her chamber dressed in black by the time Dasharatha visited her. Shocked to see her in such a state, when the whole city was celebrating, Dasharatha approached her and asked, Dear Kaiki, what's wrong with you? Without replying to his question, Kaiki said, Maharaja, do you remember, once when you were battling, I saved your chariot's wheel from slipping. Appreciating me, you wanted to grant me two boons then, but I told you that I would ask them later. As Tashirada recalled the incident and nodded in agreement, she said, I want to ask them now. Unaware of Kaikeyi's intentions, Dasharada asked her to proceed. Kaikeyi said, Firstly, I want you to make Bharata the king of Ayodhya and secondly, exile Rama for 14 years from this kingdom. Shocked to hear such ruthless words from Kaikeyi, Dasharada stood there astonished. After a while, he tried to convince Kaikeyi about her unjust demands. But as she refused to budge, not knowing what to do, Dasrada sat in her chamber helplessly. Pained deeply by the thought of sending away Rama on exile, he lost his consciousness. Unaffected by her husband's state, Kaikeyi sent a word to Rama to visit her chamber. Following her orders, Rama at once reached her chamber and bowed to her, awaiting her orders. As soon as his eyes fell on Dasharada, who lay on the floor, his eyes flickered with sorrow and he asked, Mother, please tell me the reason why my father is lying on the floor in such a state. Kaikeyi then told him about the boon she asked. Looking at him sternly, she said, Rama, as per the boons granted by your father to me, I wish to send you on exile to the forest for 14 years and make Bharata the king of Ayodhya. Following his orders, Are you ready to give up everything and move out of Ayodhya immediately? Though Kaikeyi expected Rama to argue with her, without speaking out even a single word and with a smile intact, Rama bowed to her and said, Mother, I would be glad to fulfill your wish. I am ready to go on exile. Saying so, he touched his father's feet, sought her blessings and moved out of her chamber. From there, Rama directly reached his mother Kausalya's chamber. When he found her dressed royally, waiting for the celebrations of his crowning ceremony, he at once went to her and said, Mother, I have come here with news that might bring pain to you, Sita and Lakshmana. I have been ordered to leave to the forest on exile for the next 14 years by father. In my place, he wishes to see Bharata as a future king. Please bless me and bid me farewell. Soon after he said so, Kausalya fell unconscious. After regaining her consciousness, she pleaded Rama not to leave her and go. Enraged to see the state of Kausalya, Lakshmana decided to confront Kaikeyi at once. Stopping him, Rama said, Lakshmana, as children of our parents, it is our responsibility to follow their orders and satisfy their wishes. I prefer to undergo suffering rather than stay back in Ayodhya, refusing to follow their orders. Wiping off tears from Lakshmana's eyes, Rama con comforted him and cooled him down. Finally, seeking the blessings of Kausalya and Sumitra, Rama went to Sita to inform her of his decision. Approaching Sita, he said, Sita, I have been ordered to go on exile for 14 years. In my absence, please take care of my parents and brothers. Shocked to hear the news, Sita expressed her desire to follow Rama. In spite of Rama's refusal, she stood stern on her word till Rama finally gave in. 
Lakshmana too decided to follow his brother and got ready to leave Ayodhya after seeking permission from Sumitra. Clad in normal clothes, he moved out of the palace followed by his wife Sita and his brother Lakshmana. Amidst tearful favour of Ayodhya's population, they rode away in a chariot driven by Sumantra. As soon as they reached the banks of river Ganga, Rama asked Sumantra to return to Ayodhya and asked him to take care of Ayodhya. Sumantra bid him a painful farewell and turned back his chariot towards Ayodhya. On the banks of river Ganga, Rama met Guha, the king of the Ganga valley. Having heard about the arrival of Rama in advance, Guha made all arrangements to welcome the trio. He welcomed them respectfully, washed Rama's feet with milk and said, O oh Lord, I am glad that you have accepted my invitation. I heard about the 14 years of exile. I humbly request you to spend the coming 14 years in my kingdom. Pleased with Guha's treatment, Rama said, Guha, I am happy for the affection you have showered on us. But as per my father's instructions, I have decided to spend the coming 14 years away from Ayodhya in a forest. I would be glad if you can accommodate us for one night. Goha made arrangements for their night stay and offered to take him to the other bank of the river personally. The next day morning, as decided, Goha took them to the other bank in his boat and returned to his kingdom after taking leave from them. Turning to Lakshmana, Rama said, Brother, you lead the way while Sita would follow you. I would stay behind Sita and guard her from wild animals. Following Rama's instructions, Lakshmana walked in the front leading the way. They travelled through the rocky path throughout the morning and rested under a tree in the night. The following morning, they reached the ashram of sage Bharadvaja and sought his advice about a place which would be convenient to spend the next 14 years of their exile. When they were informed of Mount Chitrakuta, the trio sought the blessings of the sage and travelled towards Chitrakuta. As soon as they reached the mountain, they were amazed to see its beauty. Various trees that bore beautiful flowers and delicious fruits surrounded the mount. The atmosphere was serene, resounding with a delicate music of water that flowed in streams. As Rama and Sita sat engrossed, enjoying the beauty of the surroundings, Lakshmana built two huts, one for the couple and the other for him. Soon, three of them got used to the life of exile and spent their time in the company of sages and saints who lived in the surroundings. Back in Ayodhya, when Dasaratha knew from Sumantra that Rama was sent on exile, his heart bled with grief. Unable to bear the thought of Rama's separation, Dasaratha fell dead, craving for Rama. On his death, Sumantra sent a word to Bharata and Satrugna, who were away from Ayodhya, asking them to return immediately. Though they stepped into the kingdom, anticipating celebrations of the crowning ceremony of Rama, on seeing the grief-stricken faces of everyone around, both sensed some trouble. As no one answered their questions, Bharata walked straight to his mother Kaikeyi, who told him the news of Dasharatha's death and Rama's exile. Annoyed with his mother, he resented her actions, accused her of disturbing the peace and harmony of the kingdom, and held her responsible for his father's death. As he sat for several hours crying for Dasharatha, sage Vasishta approached him and comforted him. He taught him the immediate course of action and arranged for the funeral of King Dasharatha. On completion of all the rituals, Vasishta addressed Bharata and said, Bharata, as per your father's wish, please accept the responsibility of ruling this kingdom. Be crowned as the king of Ayodhya. Refusing his proposal, Bharata replied, O holy sage, you are a learned man. I need not tell you that there is no better king for Ayodhya than my brother Rama. I have decided to bring my brother back into this kingdom. Instead of him, I would go on exile for 14 years. Requesting the courtiers and the people to follow him, Bharata started his journey towards the Mount Chitrakuta. 
Soon after Bharata reached the place where Rama lived, he ran towards his brother, fell on his feet and begged forgiveness. Weeping uncontrollably, he informed Rama regarding Dasharatha's death. Extremely grieved by the news, Rama stood stunned for a long while. After he recovered from grief, Bharata pleaded Rama to come back to Ayodhya and rule the kingdom, replying that he would not return to Ayodhya without fulfilling his father's orders. Rama asked Bharata to go back to Ayodhya. Bharata too had refused to be the king and stayed stern on his word. Learned men like Vasishta suggested a solution to the problem. Vasishta said, Bharata, as Rama has refused to return to Ayodhya, you shoulder the responsibility of ruling the kingdom in the name of Rama. Rama would be named the king, but you would take care of the affairs as his representative. Both the brothers accepted the pro proposal put forth by Vasishta. Turning to Rama, Bharata said, Brother, you are my lord. I wish to have your slippers in your memory. I wish to place them on the throne till you come back from exile. During the period of your exile, even I, too, would live in the same way in which you are living now. Till your return, I would live in a village named Nandi, from where I would operate. In case you fail to come back to Ayodhya after 14 years, I would sacrifice my life in the next second after completion of the 14 years. The population of Ayodhya applauded Bharata's decision, appreciated the love he had for his brother and promised to support him by all means. Chapter 6 Sita's Abduction As Rama expected people of Ayodhya to visit Chitrakuta regularly to check for his welfare, he decided to leave the place immediately. Addressing Lakshmana and Sita, he said, I have decided to move to a far-off place from Ayodhya, so let us vacate Mount Chitrakuta and go towards Dandakaranya. Seeking the blessings of sages who lived there, Rama left the place and travelled to Dandakaranya. After several days, they reached the forest and met the sages who lived there. Heartily welcomed by the inhabitants of Dandakaranya, Rama stayed there along with Sita and Lakshmana for a few days. During his stay, he had come to know that the inhabitants largely suffered in the hands of evil demons. Promising to free them from their troubles soon, Rama took leave and proceeded further towards the ashram of Sage Agastya. Sage Agastya extended a warm welcome to Rama and treated him with utmost care. Before Rama left his ashram, Sage Agastya blessed him wholeheartedly and gifted him a powerful bow. Wishing him luck, he said, Rama, may you be victorious in all your endeavors. At a short distance from here, on the banks of river Godavari, is a beautiful place called Panchavati. Build your ashram there and lead a peaceful life. Seeking the blessings of the sage, Rama, Sita and Lakshmana proceeded in the direction mentioned by him. Panchavati was, a, was more beautiful than described. Building their ashram there, the trio led a happy and peaceful life. As days rolled by, one day, Ravana's sister, Shurpanaka, visited Panchavati. As she was roaming in those surroundings, she happened to see Rama and Lakshmana. Taking an instant liking for the handsome young brothers, she immediately gathered details about them. Since the day of her visit to Panchavati, Shurpanaka only thought of both the brothers. Unable to forget them, she disguised herself as a beautiful lady and approached Rama. She tried to lure Rama with her beauty and sweet words, but refusing to even look at her, Rama said, O oh, Shurpanaka, I am a married man who took an oath to stay married only to one lady throughout my life. I would not think about any other woman except my wife Sita. Directing her towards Lakshmana, he said, There stands my brother Lakshmana. Go to him and ask him if he would accept you. Shurpanaka turned towards Lakshmana with a hope that at least he would agree to marry her. She tried her best to lure him but failed to do so. As she continued to disturb him, annoyed by her, Lakshmana cut her nose 
and ears and threw her away from the ashram, dragging her by her hair. Greatly insulted by the brothers, Shurpanaka ran with her bleeding nose and ears to her brothers, Kara and Dushana. When she narrated them of her unsuccessful trials to win over both the brothers, they were enraged by the insult their sister faced in the hands of mere humans. Gathering 14,000 Rakshasas, they went to attack Rama and Lakshmana. As Rama saw the huge army of Rakshasas, he went to counterattack them, instructing Lakshmana to take care of Sita. After a fierce battle, Rama killed the entire army including Khara and Dushana. Having lost her brothers in the battle, Shurpanaka trembled with fear and went running to her elder brother Ravana to inform about all that had happened. As she narrated the fate of her brothers and the insult she faced, she also added about the beauty of Sita. She instigated Ravana against them and told him that Rama insulted her only because of his beautiful wife. Enraged, enraged to know the details from his sister, Ravana rode in anger. Comforting Surpanaka, he said, Do not worry, dear sister. I would definitely avenge the insult you suffered. Within no time, I would get that Sita and imprison her in Lanka. Just wait and watch. How your mighty brother would insult that Rama and his wife. Glad to be promised so, Shurpanaka bowed to her brother and left his court. Ravana immediately made arrangements to reach Panchavati. Ravana immediately made arrangements to reach Panchavati. He planned to capture Sita and get her to Lanka by battling with Rama. But on a second thought, as he heard that Rama was powerful enough to kill an entire army of his brothers, he decided to abduct her by deceit. Immediately, he summoned Maricha, one of his trusted subjects. He said, Maricha, go at once to Panchavati and disguise yourself as a golden stag. I am certain that Sita would ask Rama to get the stag for her. While you engage Rama in the disguise of the stag, I would abduct Sita and carry her off to Lanka. As Ravana sketched his plan, Maricha, who already had the experience of confronting Rama, trembled in fear and replied, Ravana, please do not entertain such dangerous thoughts in your mind. I have already suffered in the hands of Rama and hid in the sea with the fear of being killed by his powerful arrow. Do not invite unnecessary troubles for yourself. Annoyed by Maricha's comments, Ravana want to kill him instantaneously if he refused to follow his orders. With no other option left, Maricha agreed to be a part of the plan. Disguised as a golden stag, he soon reached Panchavati. He roamed around Rama's ashram, attracting the attention of Sita. Unaware of its magical qualities, Sita sat engrossed, looking at the beautiful stag. Soon, she desired to own that stag. Approaching Rama, she showed him the golden stag and requested him to capture it. Refusing her plea, Rama said, Sita, I suspect a foul play. Golden stags do not exist at all. Though Rama tried to convince Sita, enchanted by the beauty of the stag, Sita paid no heed to his words. She remained stubborn on her word and continuously requested Rama to get the stag home. Giving in to her request, Rama summoned Lakshmana and instructed him to take care of Sita in his absence. As Rama followed the stag, it ran away swiftly deep into the forest. Unable to capture it, Rama shot an arrow in the direction of the stag. Shot by his powerful arrow, Maricha attained his real form and fell on the ground, badly wounded, yelling aloud, Ha Sita! Ha Lakshmana! Maricha fell dead instantaneously. Recognizing it to be intentional plan of some evildoer, Rama quickly walked towards his ashram. Meanwhile, Sita, who was waiting for Rama's return, heard the loud cries of Maricha. Mistaking it to be Rama's voice, she quickly ran to Lakshmana and asked him to go in rescue of his brother. Unaffected by the cries, Lakshma reply, Lakshmana replied, Mother, no one can harm my brother Rama. 
This must be certainly an evil plan of some wicked Rakshasas. Be rest assured and wait for his return. Disturbed by Lakshmana's complacence, Sita accused him and ordered him to go in search of Rama at once. Following her orders, Lakshmana took his bow and arrows and moved out of the ashram. Before he left, he drew a line in front of the ashram and said, Mother, I have drawn this line for your safety. Under no circumstances should you cross this line. Cautioning her repeatedly, Lakshmana rushed in to the forest searching for Rama. As soon as he was gone, Ravana, who was waiting for the opportunity, disguised himself as a saint and stood before Rama's ashram. Mother, please give me some alms, he said, addressing Sita. On hearing his words, Sita returned to the entrance of the ashram with arms and requested him to accept them. When Ravana tried to cross the lines drawn by Lakshmana, huge flames rose from the ground and stopped him from proceeding further. Noticing the powerful security lines drawn on the ground, Ravana said, Please come to me and offer me the arms. As Sita stood there, Hesitating, Ravana acted angry and warned her that he would return from that ashram empty-handed, as it would be a sin to send away a hungry man without giving alms. Sita immediately crossed the line hurriedly without a second thought. In a flash, Ravana assumed his normal form, pulled out the piece of earth where she was standing and moved towards his chariot which was stationed in a distance. He placed Sita along with the earth on his chariot and rose into the sky immediately. Recovering from the shock, Sita realized she was being abducted and shouted the name of Rama helplessly. Though Rama, who was down below on the earth, could not hear her cries, Jatayu, the mighty bird king, heard her. Deciding to rescue her from Ravana, Jatayu flew towards Ravana's chariot and confronted him. After a fierce battle between both, Ravana cut Jatayu's wings with a sword. Losing both his wings, Jatayu dropped to the ground helplessly. As Sita lost the hope of being rescued, she removed her ornaments, packed them in a piece of cloth torn from her sari and dropped them to the ground. She did so with a hope that Rama would know that she passed through that place if he found her jewels. The packet she dropped fell straight on a mountain named Rushyamukha, which was inhabited by monkeys. By the time the monkeys lifted their heads to see the person who had dropped the jewels, Ramana's chariot swiftly crossed the mountain, leaving the monkeys with no clue about Sita's abduction. Soon Ravana reached Lanka, imprisoned Sita, in Ashoka garden, leaving her amidst tight security. Chapter 7 Search for Sita Halfway through, when Rama met Lakshmana, he asked him why he was in the forest, leaving Sita alone. Lakshmana explained him about Sita's instructions and told him that he was compelled to leave her. Sensing that something was wrong, both of them fled towards the ashram without wasting any more time. But, alas, they could not find Sita anywhere near the ashram. Grieving for his beloved wife, Rama said, Why have you left her alone, Lakshmana? I am sure somebody must have harmed my Sita. How can I ever find her? Unable to see him depressed, Lakshmana comforted him that Sita would be fine somewhere and promised to search her out wherever she was. Hoping to find her somewhere in the forest, Rama and Lakshmana moved in search of her. As they proceeded searching every inch on their way, they found Jatayu in a badly wounded state. Taking pity on him, Rama approached Jatayu and asked him the reason for his state. Introducing himself to Rama, Jatayu said, O oh Rama, I am Jatayu, your father's friend. I saw Ravana, the king of Lanka, abducting Sita by force. When I fought with him to rescue her, he cut off my wings and took her away. As I watched him, 
helplessly. Saying so, Jatayu breathed his last in Rama's arms. Grieving for the mighty bird that sacrificed his life for their cause, both the brothers cremated him on the banks of river Godavari and paid him their last respects. Having known through Jatayu about abduction of Sita, both of them walked forward thinking of ways to rescue them. As they wandered through the forest, suddenly a fierce one-eyed monster named Kabanda pounced on them, caught them in his hands and held them tightly. Startled by the unexpected incident, Rama and Lakshmana remained shocked for a moment. Later, Rama took out his sword and cut off both the hands of Kabanda. As soon as he did so, the monster turned into a Gandharva and both bowed to Rama. When Rama inquired who he was, he replied, O Rama, I have been lying here in the forest since ages as a monster due to a curse. Today, by your grace, I attained my original form. Learning of Sita's abduction from them, he suggested, Rama, in a short distance from here, there is a mount named Rushyamukha. On that mount lives a monkey king named Sugriva with his subjects. Approach him for help. I am certain that he would extend his help to search for Mother Sita. Paying his respects to Rama again, Kabanda disappeared from there. As per Kabanda's advice, Rama and Lakshmana walked towards the Mount Rushyamukha. After travelling for a while, they reached Lake Pampa. On seeing a small hut on the banks of that lake, they quickly went towards it to rest for a while. There, they saw an old woman and approached her. She was none other than Sabari, a staunch devotee of Rama. As soon as she set her eyes on the duo, she quickly got up and said, O oh Rama, have you arrived finally? My weight since ages had turned fruitful today. Leading them by hand into her hut, she again said, You both look extremely tired. Let me get something to eat. Saying so, she quickly went to pluck some fruits from the garden. Sabari put them in the basket and extended it to them. For Rama, she picked out each fruit carefully, tasted them first and gave the remaining fruit to him only if it was tasty. Though Sabari tasted the fruits first, touched by her love and affection, Rama ate them gladly and blessed her wholeheartedly. After relaxing there for a while, they continued their journey towards Rushyamukha. Chapter 8. Woes of Friendship After a tedious journey, Rama and Lakshmana reached the tip of the Mount Rishyamukha. Looking at the mount, they stood wondering, unable to decide how to extend the hand of friendship to the monkey king Sugriva. Meanwhile, from the mountain, Sugriva caught a glance of both the brothers. Afraid that his elder brother Wali had sent the men, he immediately summoned his minister Hanuman and asked him to find out who they were. As per Sugriva's instructions, Hanuman disguised himself as a Brahmin and walked towards Rama and Lakshmana. Scanning them through, Hanuman thought to himself, By appearance, they look like Brahmins, but they are carrying bow and arrows like Kshatriyas. Both their faces are radiant with divine power. After all, who could these young men be? Thinking so, Hanuman reached the brothers. Addressing them, he said, Dear men, who are you? What do you want and why are you wandering here? As Lakshmana replied who they were, Rama stood smiling at Hanuman. Soon after Lakshmana finished talking, Rama said, At least now, do you recognize me, Hanuman? Thrilled to see his lord before him, Hanuman took his original form and bowed at once to Rama and said, O oh Rama, no doubt it is you. Please forgive my ignorance and bless me. Placing the brothers on his arms, he at once flew towards the place where Sugriva dwelt on the mount. He introduced them to Sugriva, who was equally excited to meet the duo. While Lakshmana narrated Sita's abduction to Sugriva and others, Hanuman told them about Wali's unjust behavior with Sugriva. He said, O oh Lord, just like how you are suffering from Mother Sita, Sugriva too is suffering because of his brother Wali. 
who imprisoned his wife and threw him away from Kishkinda, his kingdom, for no fault of his. Since then, Sugriva had taken shelter on this mountain, away from his wife, children and kingdom. Looking at Rama and Sugriva, Hanuman again said, Since you both are going through the same grief, I suggest that you should help each other and get over the troubles collectively. When both the parties nodded in agreement, Hanuman lit a holy fire between them and made them take oaths of friendship. Rama promised Sugriva to help him regain his kingdom and wife by killing Vali. As Vali was a mighty king, Sugriva was apprehensive about Rama's ability to kill him. As he fell silent in deep thoughts, Rama realized his doubts and decided to prove his ability to Sugriva. Immediately, he took out a single arrow and shot it, aiming at the seven palm trees that stood in a row at some distance. With a single shot of his arrow, all the seven trees were chopped into half and fell to the ground instantaneously. Amazed at the rare sight, Sugriva at once fell at Rama's feet. O oh Lord, I ask for forgiveness for not realizing your might. Now, I know that you are the mightiest in this whole world. I am glad that you accepted me as your friend. With a sweet smile, Rama embraced Sugriva and asked him to invite his brother Wali for a battle. With regained confidence that Rama was behind him, Sugriva went to Wali's palace and provoked him for a fight. Enraged at his brother's behavior, Wali came out from his palace and battled fiercely with Sugriva. Wali was stronger and more skilled than Sugriva. As they both fought with one another, Rama, who was watching them from a distance, got confused in identifying Wali. With the fear of killing Sugriva, he withdrew his attempts to shoot his arrow. As there was no sign of help from Rama, unable to fight any more with Wali, Sugriva ran away from there. He reached the mount in a badly wounded state and approached Rama immediately. Accusing Rama for not rendering any help, he said, O oh Rama, I prov provoked my brother for a fight, trusting your words. But you have done nothing except watching the fun of me getting wounded in his hands. Comforting Sugriva, Rama explained that he could not differentiate between the brothers. Putting a floral garland around Sugriva's neck, he promised to kill Wali and asked Sugriva to call him again for a fight. Fearing extremely, Sugriva again went to Wali's palace and repeated his challenge. Amused that the loser Sugriva came back again for a fight, Wali at once rushed out. As they fought fiercely with one another, at the right moment, Rama shot his arrow from behind a tree, straight into the heart of Wali. Shot by such a powerful arrow, Wali at once fell on the ground. Addressing Rama who approached him, Wali said, O oh Rama, it surprises me that a great man like you also had resorted to unfair means of fighting a battle. Is it not unjust to kill me, sir? Replying to Wali, Rama said, Is it not unjust to abduct your brother's wife by force and throw him away from the kingdom without learning the facts? As per Rajadharma, it is acceptable to punish the guilty in accordance to their evil deeds. Realizing his fault, Wali repented his hasty actions. With no time left for him, he quickly handed over his son Angada to Rama and died peacefully in his arms. Rama and Lakshmana comforted the grieving Tara, wife of Wali, Angada, his son and Sugriva. They conducted his last rites as per the rituals and made Sugriva the king of Kishkinda after a few days. With Sugriva's problem solved, the next important thing of their agenda was searching for Sita. Though everyone was anxious to trace her soon, they could not start their trials due to heavy rains. Sugriva promised to accomplish his task soon after the rainy season ended. For Rama, who was away from his beloved wife Sita, the rainy season appeared longer than ever. He spent every minute with a heavy heart engrossed in Sita's thoughts. One day, during their conversation, Sugriva mentioned, Rama, a few months back, a pack of jewels was dropped from the sky from a chariot 
that drove over the Mount Rushimukha. But before we could see who it was, the chariot vanished. That pack landed straight into Hanuman's lap. Let me show you those jewels, lest they belong to Mother Sita. As Rama opened the pack handed over to him, he recognized that they belonged to Sita. Holding the pack near his heart, Rama confirmed that they were his wife's jewels. Overcome by grief, Rama fainted, still holding the jewels in his hands. Worried about Rama, Lakshmana and Sugriva nursed him back to consciousness. Unable to see him suffering any more, Sugriva at once commanded his team to get ready for the task. Sugriva divided his most trustworthy members into different teams and sent them in all the four directions. Under Angada's guidance, Jambavanta, Hanuman and a few other best men were sent in the southern direction. Sugriva sternly ordered his men to come back with news within a month and warned them that they would be beheaded if there were any lack of efforts. Though Rama silently sat with Sugriva, watching all the teams disperse, when he saw Hanuman, his face shone with hope. Calling him aside, Rama said, Hanuman, I somehow trust that you are the right man for this job. I am certain that you are going to find Sita. Handing over his ring, he again spoke, Hanuman, when you meet Sita, give her this ring and tell her that I am grieving for her. Overwhelmed by the trust Rama had on him, Hanuman bowed to his lord in reverence and left the place immediately. Though Angada and his team searched everywhere, they could not trace Sita. Finally, they reached the Mount Mahindra and sat there dejected. As they discussed about Sita among themselves, Jatayu's brother Sampati, a huge eagle, saw the team of monkeys. Glad that he got nice food to eat, he approached them at once. But when he overheard their discussion, he asked, Whom are you talking about? When Hanuman narrated the whole story and also mentioned about Jatayu's death, Sampati was shocked to hear the news. Is my brother dead? said the grieving Sampati. Deciding instantaneously to help the team, he said, Friends, I have seen Ravana taking away Sita towards his kingdom Lanka. Lanka is situated on the other side of the sea. Hearing the news, Hanuman and his team thanked Sampati and took leave from him to proceed further. The team was excited about the information they gathered till they reached the sea. But as soon as their eyes fell on the huge sea that stood in between them and Lanka, they all sat down in dejection, not knowing how to cross the sea in such a little time available. Angada said, I could cross the sea, but I am not certain if I can return. Refusing to let Angada proceed on the mission, the others said, We cannot allow you to shoulder such a huge responsibility. If you are harmed in any way, Sugriva would burn us all alive. As they sat discussing various means of crossing the sea, Hanuman removed himself from that place and sat worried thinking of Rama. He was already guilty for not living up to Rama's expectations. Noticing Hanuman, Jambavanta approached him and said, Hanuman, what are you doing here? You have the ability to achieve the most complex tasks with great ease. This sea is not a real hurdle for a strong man like you. What are you still thinking about? There is no task that is impossible for you. Due to the curse in his childhood, Hanuman lost the ability to realize his powers on his own. Someone had to remind him of his powers and encourage him to undertake a difficult task. As soon as Jambavanta instilled confidence in him, Hanuman rose at once, regained his full strength and turned to his team. He said, Don't you worry, I am going to cross the sea and trace Mother Sita. Saying so, he grew in size and flew over the high sea as his team looked at him in awe. Encountering all the problems he faced during his flight of 800 miles and killing the ferocious demons named Surasa and Simhika, Hanuman landed on the Mount Trikuta located in Lanka before the night fell. Chapter 9 Lanka and Kios 
Hanuman sat on the mountain till midnight, enjoying the beauty of Lanka. He was amazed to notice the richness and the serenity of that place. Observing Lanka and its prosperity, he understood that Ravana was a very efficient ruler who took great care of his people. Trying to assess Ravana's qualities and valor, Hanuman spent his time till midnight in order to gain entry into Lanka. Disguised as a tiny monkey, Hanuman climbed up the main wall of the palace and jumped inside. He started moving around the place in his tiny form, trying to trace the whereabouts of Sita. Though everyone else was fast asleep, a fierce demon and a female guard named Lankini sensed his presence. She quickly caught hold of him and tried to kill him from entering into Lanka secretly. But Hanuman took his normal form and killed her after a fierce battle. As soon as he killed her, Lankani took the form of a divine woman and told him, I have been guarding the city since a long time in the form of a demon due to a curse. I was told that a powerful monkey warrior would free me from the curse. I am glad you came here tonight. May you achieve success in the task you have undertaken. Saying so, Lankani vanished from there. After her, there was no one awake in Lanka to stop Hanuman. He roamed around all the places in search of Sita. Finally, he reached Ravana's chamber and found a beautiful lady fast asleep in his chamber. Seeing her, he initially mistook her to be Sita. Later, he realized that a divine woman like Sita would never accept to be placed in Ravana's chamber and cursed himself for thinking incorrectly. Quickly, he moved out of the chamber for the fear of waking up Ravana and decided to search for Sita in the remaining places. Out of desperation, he looked for her in the horse's stable too, but could not find her. Exhausted and frustrated, Hanuman sat down on the floor and started looking around for any other place he might have missed out. As he looked around at some distance, he found a garden. I haven't checked the garden yet. Maybe I can find Mother Sita there, he thought. Without wasting even a single minute, he reached the garden. That garden was nothing but Ashoka garden, where Ravana had imprisoned Sita. Hanuman jumped from one tree to another trying to locate Sita. Suddenly, under a tree, he saw a beautiful woman with saddened face. As he was about to approach the tree, bright lights dazzled his eyes. In order to remain hidden, he quickly hid behind the branches of the tree he was on and looked at the source of light. As the guards announced his arrival, Ravana went straight to the tree under which Sita was seated. Addressing her, he said, Sita, what have you decided? Do you still want to wait for the unfortunate exiled Rama or would you like to experience all the comforts by being the queen of this great Ravana? Holding a straw of dried grass in her hands, in order to maintain distance from Ravana, Sita replied, Wicked man, you are alive today only because you abducted me when my husband was away. Otherwise, you would have been killed then itself. There is nothing for me to think. You only think twice and hand me over to my husband, asking for his forgiveness before it is too late. Otherwise, you would be killed mercilessly by him. On hearing her words, Ravana roared in anger and replied, Stop talking about your husband now. A mere human like your husband cannot harm me. If you are under the impression that he would come for your rescue, then it is impossible. Ridiculing her, he again said, How could a man who could not trace and rescue you since the past ten months come now? I am giving you a time of two months more. Change your heart by then and accept me. Trembling with anger, Ravana left the wailing Sita and walked towards his palace. While a few demons that were guarding her frightened her by speaking about Ravana's might, others sympathized with her and asked her to get some sleep. Soon all the guards fell asleep. But Sita sat there still crying, repeating the name of her lord Rama continuously. 
Hanuman waited till the right time, and as soon as he confirmed that everyone was asleep, he jumped from the tree and bowed to Sita. He said, "Mother, please accept the respects of Hanuman, Lord Rama's messenger." Startled by his sudden appearance, Sita mistook his presence to another trick of Ravana and turned her face away. Hanuman immediately sensed her apprehension. In order to free her from her doubts, he took out Rama's ring and extended it to her. As Sita saw the ring with disbelief and joy, Hanuman explained her everything about Rama's condition. Sita became sorrowful listening to Hanuman's words. As she shed silent tears, moved by her state, Hanuman said, "Mother, please do not worry. Now that I have traced you, Lord Rama would immediately come and rescue you within a short period. But if you think that you cannot stay here any more, with your permission, I am ready to take you from here now itself. We would be at the lotus feet of Lord Rama before dawn." Surprised to see such a tiny being speaking of carrying her, Sita said, "But son, how could you do so when you are such a tiny creature?" Smiling at her words, Hanuman humbly replied, "Do not doubt my words, mother. I can surely accomplish the task I spoke of." Saying so, Hanuman rose to a great height and showed her his original form and strength. Sita was even more surprised to see a tiny creature grow so big in front of her eyes but still she said Hanuman no doubt you are an able person to take me away from here but such an act would only leave a permanent mark on Lord Rama's character that he could not rescue his wife bravely moreover there would be no difference left between Ravana and Rama if we do so so please inform my lord that i am anxiously waiting for him to rescue me she took out an ornament from her hair placed in hanuman's hands and requested him to hand it over to rama hanuman took the ornament from her hid safely and sought sita's permission to eat some fruits from the garden when sita permitted him to satisfy his hunger on the pretext of eating fruits hanuman created kiosks in lanka After eating the fruits of each tree he uprooted them and kicked them away within a few minutes the beautiful ashoka garden was distracted beyond recognition as it was already dawn some of the guards noticed his acts and confronted him all such men who tried to stop him lay dead on the ground within seconds as hanuman continued to create ruckus the remaining guards who had no courage to confront him ran to ravana to inform him about the destruction highly angered by the news brought by his guards that a monkey had destroyed his beautiful garden he roared at them for not being skilled enough to tackle a single monkey dismissing them from his court he summoned his son akshakumara and ordered him to put an end to that monkey bowing to his father Akshakumara immediately started towards the garden with his men. Within a few minutes, Ravana received news that Akshakumara was dead. Unable to digest the fact that a mere monkey had killed his brave son, Ravana summoned his another son, Meghnada, who was not only brave but also talented. Promising not to return without the monkey, Meghnada went towards the garden. He was enraged when he saw the destroyed garden. his dead brother and guards thinking that the monkey was not an ordinary one he decided to use the most powerful weapons against him meghnada's powerful weapons too could not harm hanuman frustrated with hanuman's strength and determined determined not to return empty handed meghnada finally used brahmastra on hanuman having received a boon that even brahmastra cannot harm him Hanuman stood fearlessly as Meghnada shot it at him. But on a second thought, Hanuman decided to surrender to Meghnada and got tied up by it. Immediately, Meghnada led him to Ravana's court triumphantly. As soon as Hanuman entered the court, to Meghnada's surprise, he shook himself free of the bondage. He stood in the center of the court and looked at Ravana. As Hanuman was spellbound by Ravana's radiance momentarily 
Ravana roared at him angrily and said, Wicked monkey, how did you enter Lanka? Why did you come here and why did you destroy the garden? In reply to his questions, Hanuman said, O king, first learn to respect your guests. If you can wait for a while, I would answer all your questions. Saying so, he grew his tail in length, circled it and made a high seat for him. He at once jumped about and sat on his tail. Looking down at Ravana, who was seated far below, he said, I am the minister of Sugriva, the king of Kishkinda. As a messenger of Lord Rama, I came here in search of Mother Sita. I saw her here, but before I left Lanka, I wanted to advise you to ask for Lord Rama's forgiveness. That's why I destroyed your garden and surrendered to your son intentionally to meet you. Follow my advice and change your mind before it is too late. As Hanuman counseled Ravana, unable to bear his words, Ravana yelled at him and asked him to stop talking at once. Turning to his courtiers, he said, My brave men, kill this monkey right away. As soon as Ravana passed his orders, Vibhishana, his brother, stood up and said, Brother, do not be hasty. It is not fair to kill someone who had visited our kingdom as a messenger. Please leave him free. Though Ravana dismissed the thought of killing Hanuman, he did not want to leave him free without punishment. He ordered his men to light his tail afire. As the courtiers attempted to wrap clothes around his tail, Hanuman increased his tail in length. As the frustrated courtiers struggled to finish their job, Hanuman stood amused and watched the fun. Finally, taking pity on them, Hanuman allowed them to light his tail. As the courtiers heaved a sigh of relief, amused Hanuman bade them farewell and flew around Lanka with his burning tail, setting fire to each and every corner of the beautiful city. After burning down the golden Lanka to ashes, Hanuman visited Sita again, took her permission and headed back to the sea in order to put off the fire on his tail. Soon, with the same vigour and strength, Hanuman returned to his team, who awaited his return anxiously. Chapter 10 The Rama Ravana War On seeing the return of Hanuman from a distance, his team jumped with joy. While Jambavanta embraced him with tear-filled eyes, Angada and others looked at him anxiously to hear the news he had got from Lanka. After they knew about Sita and also of his accomplishments, they praised him endlessly and returned to Kishkinda at once. Though all the other teams returned without any news, Rama hoped to get some news from Hanuman. He anxiously waited for his team to return. Finally, after a long wait, Rama saw Hanuman returning along with his team. As soon as Hanuman reached Kishkinda, he went straight to Rama, touched his feet and sought his blessings. Triumphantly, he informed, My Lord, I have seen Mother Sita, taking out the ornament he brought out, brought along with him. He said, Lord, Mother asked me to hand this over to you. Rama felt extremely happy hearing the news. Unable to contain himself, he embraced Hanuman and applauded his great work. After settling down, Hanuman narrated his experience in Lanka to Sugriva, Rama, Lakshmana and others in detail. As they knew where Sita was, all of them decided to wage a war against Ravana at the earliest. Consulting the learned men of the kingdom, Sugriva fixed an auspicious day and started with a huge army to Lanka for the war that was to follow. Back at Lanka, Ravana sat dazed, wondering how a monkey could destroy his entire kingdom in a day. He summoned all his ministers and said, The monkey now knows that Sita is here. He is sure to give the news to Rama and return with huge monkey army to wage a war against us. We have to quickly think of various ways to attack them. Hearing his words, instead of cautioning him, the ministers of his court nullified his fears and said that it was not a big task for a king like Ravana and his army to defeat monkeys and humans. As Ravana th sat thinking, Vibhishana, who was also present in the court, stood up and said, Brother, please do not ignore the damage one single monkey had caused to our kingdom. 
If one monkey could do this, just imagine what an army of monkeys can do to us. Moreover, Rama is not an ordinary man. As we are at fault, I request you to ask for Rama's forgiveness at least now. Irritated by Vibhishna's words, Ravana retorted, How dare you talk to me in this manner? Don't you feel ashamed to speak high of an enemy? You do not deserve to be in Lanka anymore. Get out of my sight before I kill you. Worrying about his brother's arrogance and foolishness, Vibhishna silently left the court and reached Rama, who was on the other side of the sea. As he begged for Rama's mercy, Rama agreed to make him a part of his army. However, Sugriva was apprehensive about Vibhishna's inclusion in their team. Then, Hanuman, who had witnessed Vibhishna's just behavior, convinced Sugriva that he was not a harmful man. During their conversations, Rama promised to make Vibhishna the king of Lanka, Surprised at his haste in declaring Vibhishana as the future king of Lanka, Sugriva expressed his doubt what Rama would do if Ravana too came begging for forgiveness. With an unaltered smile, Rama turned to Sugriva and said, If ever Ravana, Ravana came to me asking for pardon, then too I would stand on my word. I would make Vibhishana the king of Lanka and Ravana the king of Ayodhya. The entire army stood spellbound at his reply and soon their silence broke into a roaring applause in appreciation of his magnanimity. Soon the army reached the sea. Rama ordered his men to build a bridge across the sea. Rama bowed to Samudra, the god of sea, and requested him to help him build a bridge over him. Though Rama prayed to him continuously for three days, there was no sight of Samudra. Enraged by his indifference, Rama aimed an arrow at the sea to split him into two halves. Terrified by Rama's anger, Samudra appeared and asked forgiveness for his delay. He said, Lord Rama, your arrow would destroy the entire life that exists in me. Please spare the creatures which are all none but your own cre creations. Rama cooled down with his plea and dismissed his idea of harming the sea. But once his arrow was aimed, it could not be taken back. As he stood there thinking of a solution, Samudra pointed out to a mountain and said, Rama, that mountain is the only one that could bear the impact of your arrow. Please aim it towards the mountain. Following his instructions, Rama diverted his arrow towards the mountain, which broke into pieces immediately after his arrow hit it. Rocks and boulders rolled down the mountain endlessly. Samudra then asked Nala, the builder, to design a bridge on the sea and promised to keep the rocks afloat on the water. Thus, the bridge was soon ready and the army entered Langa, passing through it. Soon, Ravana received news that Rama was ready for the war. Though his grandfather, Malayavanta, tried to convince him to give up his intentions of war with Rama, Ravana paid no heed to his words. He summoned his army and passed orders to be prepared for the war. Meanwhile, following the rules of the war, Rama intended to send Angada as a messenger to Ravana to give him a last chance of retreat. Angada agreed to the proposal and went to meet Ravana. Standing in Ravana's court, Angada said, O oh Ravana, I am Angada, son of Vali. I have come here as a messenger from Lord Rama, giving you a last chance to change your mind. Rama wanted to me to find out if you would ask for pardon and respectfully return Mother Sita to him, or if you would like to lose your life proceeding with the war. Laughing aloud, on hearing Angada's words, Ravana replied that there was no chance of extending a friendly hand or seeking pardon from Rama. Boasting about himself and his army, Ravana ridiculed how a mere human could defeat him with the help of stupid monkeys. Enraged by his words, Angada replied, O oh Ravana, you seem to be very anxious about the war. Well, look at your beautiful Lanka for the last time before coming to the war because 
you would be soon dead in the hands of our lord ravana immediately ordered his men to kill angada at once standing fearlessly between the men angada laughed aloud and said first try moving my leg you can think of killing me later hearing his challenge all the courtiers and guards went one by one to angada to mose leg he firmly planted to the ground in spite of several trials no one could move his leg in the least frustrated by his men's failure ravana impulsively descended his throne and tried to hold angada's leg ridiculing him angada kicked off ravana's crown with his leg and said why do you want to hold my leg if your life is sweet to you then seek lord rama's pardon at once saying so he flew away from the court and reached rama's tent as he narrated the entire episode rama decided that there was no other alternative except war there was a fierce battle between both the armies sugriva hanuman and angada fought with all their might to kill the most important men of ravana's army ravana was stunned to see the skillful attack of the monkey warriors he could not understand how to tackle them as soon as he sensed that the most powerful men of his army were dead he ordered meghnada to take charge of the war being a skillful warrior meghnada proved to be a tough fight to angada and lakshmana finally when angada killed meghnada's chariot rider unable to confront him meghnada resorted to magical tricks and attacked rama and lakshmana with nagastra because of which they lost their consciousness and by being tied up by snakes thinking that they were dead meghnada triumphantly walked back to the palace to give his father the news as both of them embraced each other out of happiness they heard a loud sound of a bow which was unmistakably rama's bow surprised by the sound both of them ran to see where it came from ravana and meghnada were stunned to see rama and lakshmana back in the battlefield as usual as they struggled to understand how they could be freed from the impact of nagastra they saw garuda the divine eagle flying high in the sky at once they understood that garuda had come for their rescue maddened with anger ravana decided to wake up his another brother kumbhakarna from sleep kumbhakarna was a huge man who ate for 6 months and slept for another 6 months in a year with great difficulty kumbhakarna finally got up from his deep slumber after he came to know of the war he promised to help ravana by all means as he walked into the battlefield vibhishana stopped him and said kumbhakarna do not kill yourself by participating in this war i have told this to ravana but he paid no attention to my words at least you convince him so that we can be spared replying to him kumbhakarna said brother i know that ravana is wrong i also know that rama is not a mere human being but the incarnation of lord vishnu while you are fortunate to be at rama's side i love ravana too much to desert him now i would try my best to help him with this war win this war but even if i have to sacrifice my life i would only be glad to be killed by lord rama saying so he bid a tearful farewell to vibhishana and proceeded towards the battlefield as soon as he entered the battlefield with his huge personality the monkey warriors were frightened many of them got crushed under his feet while the others died with a blow of his hand none in rama's army could withstand the might of kumbhakarna finally rama went ahead determined to end kumbhakarna even rama's weapons could not harm him finally rama used his most powerful weapon and chopped off the arms and legs of kumbhakarna as he fell to the ground and rolled rolled in pain many warriors fell under his weight and died instantaneously rama used another weapon that took kumbhakarna away from the battlefield finally rama chopped his head with his arrow and sent it flying to ravana's palace as ravana saw his brother's chopped head at his feet he stood all alone losing half his might ravana's 
fall back was only Meghanada. He summoned him and sent him to the war again. Meghanada was confident because he knew that only a man who had not eaten or slept continuously for 14 years could kill him. Confident that no such man existed, Meghanada went to the battlefield again. But soon, he came to know of a man who could kill him. He was none other than Lakshmana. A fierce battle took place between Meghanada and Lakshmana. Both of them were equally skillful. As Meghanada fought with Lakshmana by being on his chariot, Lakshmana sat on the shoulders of Hanuman and continued his fight. Soon, Lakshmana destroyed Meghanada's chariot. As he stood on the ground, following the rules of the war, Lakshmana too descended from Hanuman's shoulders and fought with Meghanada. Finally, aiming an arrow at Meghanada, Lakshmana thought, If my brother Rama is an icon of justice and a man who had never lied throughout his life, then this arrow should kill Meghanada. Thinking of Rama, Lakshmana shot the arrow straight at Meghanada, which soon separated his face from his body. Thrilled by the sight, Rama at once reached Lakshmana and embraced him. He nursed his wounds affectionately amidst the floral rain from the heaven. As soon as Ravana came to know of his son's death, he prepared for the last phase of the war and decided to face the brothers personally. The following morning, as he rushed towards Lakshmana, Rama stopped him in between and shot powerful arrows at Ravana. Both of them used their skills to stop each other's attack. Though Ravana's faces fell down, shot by Rama's arrows, they fixed back automatically to their original positions. But from every drop of Ravana's blood that touched the ground, thousands of Rakshasas took birth. Meanwhile, Vibhishana and Lakshmana too joined Rama in his fight against Ravana. Reminded of Meghanatha's death, Ravana immediately shot a powerful arrow at Lakshmana that made him unconscious instantaneously. Instantaneously, Rama grieved for his beloved brother and sat there shocked looking at Lakshmana, shedding tears. When no one could console him, Jambavanta came forward and said, Rama, Lakshmana is not dead. He fell unconscious due to the power of the weapon. He immediately called for Susena, the doctor. Examining Lakshmana, Susena said that he would be fine if a medicinal herb known as Sanjeevani could be brought for his treatment before dawn. As Rama turned to Hanuman in anticipation, he bowed to Rama and flew in the direction pointed out by Susena to get the herb. He flew swifter than ever and reached the mount where Sanjeevani grew. Unable to identify Sanjeevani among the herbs present there, Hanuman uprooted the entire mountain, placed it on his palm and flew back towards Lanka. As soon as Susena picked up the herb and treated Lakshmana, he got up immediately as if he had risen from deep sleep. Rama's joy knew no bounds when he saw his beloved brother alive and healthy. The following day, Rama confronted Ravana with increased vigor. Indra sent a divine chariot for Rama from heaven on which he ascended and fought with Ravana. But he was surprised to find that Ravana's heads reached their respective places even after being chopped off. As it continued for a while, finally, Rama chanted the mantra, Sage Agastya taught him and aimed his arrow at Ravana. The impact of the mantra, the arrow rushed straight to his abdomen, where Ravana's life existed. Soon, with a loud cry, Ravana fell to the ground and breathed his last. While there was floral rain from heaven celebrating the end of Ravana, Rama's army danced out of joy. Mandodri, Ravana's wife, and other women of Lanka cried for Ravana, while his army stood with their heads bowed down. Vibhishna stood shocked looking at his dead brother, unable to control his grief. Sensing his emotions, Ravana consoled the bereaved brother and arranged for the final rites of Ravana. Immediately, Vibhishna was made the king of Lanka and Lakshmana crowned him the king following Rama's orders. Chapter 11 Test of Chastity 
Soon after he became the king, Vibhishana first ordered his wife, daughter, and other ladies to inform Sita of Rama's victory and ask them to fetch her to the court respectfully. As soon as Sita came, Vibhishana approached her, touched her feet, and pleaded forgiveness for the evil acts of Ravana. He then handed her over to Rama, once again apologizing to the couple. Immediately after Sita saw Rama, as her eyes filled with tears, she fell at his feet and said, My Lord, how my eyes have waited to see you. I am glad I could meet you at least now. Looking affectionately at Sita, Rama said, Sita, I fulfilled my responsibility as your husband by freeing you from Ravana. But as you have stayed away from me for such a long period, it is now your turn to prove your chastity to the world. Agreeing to his condition, Sita said, I would do anything to save you from ridicule, my lord. Please arrange for a pyre. Shocked by the conversation, everyone stood in silence for several minutes. On hearing Rama's demand, angered Lakshmana looked at his brother in disbelief, but out of his respect for him, remained silent. Later, following Rama's instructions, Lakshmana arranged a pyre for Sita, shedding tears. Soon, the pyre was lit and flames rose to a great height. Without any hesitation, at the great shock and sorrow of the watchers, Sita walked into the burning flames after bowing to Rama and the fire. But to their great, greater shock and wonder, she was completely unharmed. Instead, Agni, the fire god, came out of the flames along with her and said, Rama, she is as pure and chaste as fire. In fact, with her entry, I have been purified of all my vices. Please accept your wife. Agni handed her over to Rama and vanished from there. As blessings poured from heaven, Rama took Sita by her hand and took her to his side. As Sita remained spellbound at Rama's behavior, he explained her that he had never doubted her purity, even for a second. But the people of the world would not have honored her if she had not passed this Agni Pariksha, or the test of purity before the eyes of millions, who believed that Agni would destroy the impure and sinful, but not harm the pure and innocent. As Rama explained the real cause behind asking Sita to prove her purity, Lakshmana felt guilty for doubting his brother. Sugriva, Hanuman and the others, who stood shocked till then, broke into applause after knowing the large-heartedness of their lord. Every person there understood that Rama was a people's man who lived for them and placed their values ahead of his own comforts. As Rama embraced his beloved wife Sita, millions of people who watched the rare couple blessed them with tear-filled eyes. Chapter 12 Rama, the King of Ayodhya Amidst the joyful cries of millions of people, Rama turned to Vibhishana and told him that he had to reach Ayodhya as his exile had come to an end. Worried that Bharata would be waiting for him, Rama wanted to reach Ayodhya at once. They all travelled in a special chariot arranged by Vibhishana that flew at a great speed. While Sita and Rama stopped in between to take the blessings of Sage Bharadvaja, Hanuman flew to Nandi village to inform Bharata of Rama's arrival. Rama's family gathered at the village anxiously awaiting his arrival. As soon as they descended, Bharata and Sitrukna sought their blessings and extended a warm welcome to the couple and Lakshmana. Seeking the blessings of Kausalya, Sumitra and Kaigehi, the trio headed towards Ayodhya amidst pompous celebrations. Soon, Vasishta and other learned men fixed an auspicious date for the crowning ceremony of Rama. The entire population of Ayodhya rejoiced the moment and took part in the celebrations. Sugriva, Vibhishana, Guha and Hanuman attended the ceremony. 
while hanuman took an active part running around busily others watched him affectionately rama and sita were dressed up suitably for the occasion as the priests and sages chanted holy mantras vasishta led them to the throne and seated them on it bharata approached rama with the slippers he took from him placing them near his feet he said brother i have fulfilled my responsibility by being your representative now please relieve me and take care of your kingdom saying so he bowed and touched his feet hanuman took the seat near rama's feet and settled there singing praises for the lord rama called out each and every one who was associated with him during his testing times and gave away precious gifts to them finally he turned towards sita and adorned her with a chain made of precious pearls looking at rama with reverence sita called out hanuman and said son please come here quickly hanuman reached her and asked her what her order was as he stood before her with folded hands sita removed the pearl chain gifted to her by rama and handed it over to hanuman overwhelmed by her affection hanuman took it and fell at the feet of the couple to seek their blessings as everyone was overjoyed to see the radiant couple kausalya sumitra and kaikeyi's joy knew no bounds lakshmana stood beside the couple as alert as usual but with a smile on his face that increased his own radiance rama along with sita ruled ayodhya efficiently for the next several years that followed the kingdom prospered with peace and happiness praising their lord the people lived happily ever after under the golden rule of lord rama jai shri ram